it gives me very great pleasure to come to the Foreign Policy Association. As you just have heard, the organization gave me my uh, opportunity for my first real publication, uh, which was focused on Iraq in 1952. And the Foreign Policy Association, I need not tell you, has always had a very crucial role in our society, educating us about the world. And never before have we needed as much as we do today. It sometimes takes courage and always requires ferreting out obscure information and presenting it in a digestible form to large numbers of people. So I say bravo to all of you in the Foreign Policy Association. Speaking more personally, I found performing the task that you do on a personal basis is often very lonely and occasionally very contentious. Uh, I've had to get accustomed to being virtually alone, as many of you have, on uh, major policy issues. I'm having a little trouble speaking right into the microphone. Is that better? Yeah. I have um, a hearing problem, which my wife tells me results in my voice dropping. So if you don't hear me uh, scream or shout or do something or other, and incidentally, any time anybody wants to interrupt or ask a question or disagree or anything, that's perfectly all right. So uh, I'd like to make this as informal as, as you would. Um, I want to tell you um, my idea of being a historian is that it's lots of fun to study the past and sometimes it helps you to understand the present. But what really is interesting is if it helps you project into the future. And um, I had a couple of particularly interesting episodes that made me feel about that. Uh, when I was on the Policy Planning Council years ago, I um, was very disturbed about what we were then doing on Vietnam. And my then chairman of the council was Walt Rostow, who was, of course, the principal architect of our involvement in Vietnam. And we disagreed rather violently about what we were doing. He was an extremely fair-minded, intelligent man. And he said one day, why don't you just take six weeks off and go find out everything you can and then come back and tell us what you found out about it, hoping, of course, that I would come to his conclusion. And I didn't. Uh, and the result of that was that I was asked to lecture at the National War College to all of the, the best and the brightest of our younger colonels who were mostly ready to go out to Vietnam. And uh, I went through an analysis of guerrilla warfare and ended with a prediction that we were going to lose the war. And I've never had a ho as hostile an audience as I had that time. I really thought I was going to be lynched before I got out of the room. But unlike you tonight, the officers there were under very strict discipline. So when I got ready to leave the room, they all stood up and uh, at attention and applauded wildly. And I rushed out of the room as fast as I possibly could. <laughs> but years later, I was invited back to talk about the same topic. And I decided to protect myself that time, so I said, I'm really just trying to be provocative and make you think about these issues. And an Army Brigadier General got up and said, I don't understand why you pulled your punches. We all agree with you. So I told him the story of my first time there, and he said, yes, but we've all been to Vietnam now. Uh, Vietnam was a very expensive school for America. And years uh, passed, and um, various other episodes came very much like that. But when we started to get into um, the situation in Iraq, um, my illustrious colleague and friend and, and uh, chairman, uh, Bill Kerry, agreed that I should go out to Baghdad and talk to a lot of people about what was going on. And uh, I had the most amazing uh, experience of wandering the streets of Baghdad and talking to everybody from the Deputy Prime Minister down to literally to street sweepers. And um, came back and was able to try to say what the Iraqis seemed to be interested in, what their, their view of the situation was, literally just a few days before the, the attack. I could walk the streets of Baghdad without any trouble at all at that time. Of course, if I go back today, I'd be shot immediately. Um, taken hostage. Taken hostage, and, and <laughs> that would be the least of it. Um, I'd like to move from this position of having made predictions in the past. Um, there are several others I won't go into. Uh, to a prediction tonight. I think we're right on the brink of a new war in the Middle East. And um, I think that it's highly likely 
that the war will come very soon, but I think it's practically certain that we will be engaged in a war with Iran before the end of President Bush's term. I arrive at this prediction from a series of points of view. One is, I begin with the President. Long before he ran for the presidency, Mr. Bush handled the relationship of his father's campaign with the American Christian fundamentalists. He realized they constituted a massive voting bloc with something like one out of every five Americans either associated with it or in sympathy with it. And about that time, he also went, as you all know, under a personal rebirth and emerged with the belief that he had a special God-given role to fight off the forces of evil and prepare for the new world order. And he was guided into his policy considerations by a group of like-minded men, <clears throat> some of them his father's old retainers, including Dick Cheney and Donald Rumsfeld. And this group of people led him into the um, a group called roughly the neoconservatives who he decided were some of the best brains in our country. And among them was the point man on the, for the Middle East today in the National Security Council, Elliot Abrams, who's best known for his role in the Iran-Contra affair years ago. He's backed by a number of other neoconservatives who are now or formally in key positions in the government, including Paul Wolfowitz, Richard Pearl, Douglas Fyth, Stephen Campbell, and John Bolton here in New York with you, James Wosley, Richard Armitage, Lewis Libby, Abram Shulsky, and David Wumser. These men are backed up and supported and publicized by a large group outside the government who are associated with um, various of the neoconservative think tanks, so-called, and with various publications. And they all agree on a central theme, which is that America has a role in reshaping most of the world and beginning with the Middle East. The basis of their doctrine they took from Leon Trotsky's concept of permanent revolution and adapted it to their own radical ideology in the guise of permanent war. Just as Trotsky said permanent revolution was the means to overawe and destroy foreign opponents and to cow or silence domestic uh, critics, so the neoconservatives see permanent war. War would give them irresistible force because to oppose them would seem an unpatriotic act. And as one of their group, the former CIA director James Wosley put it, this fourth world war, I think, will last considerably longer than either World War II or World War I did for us. Hopefully not the full four decades plus of the Cold War. The long war, which has been very widely publicized, the neoconservatives have promoted, <clears throat> has been embraced by President Bush, Vice President Cheney, Secretary of Defense Rumsfeld, as the basis of American foreign policy. And estimates put the cost of implementing it at something on the order of $15 trillion. <clears throat> the key official document in this is the March 6, 2006 National Security Strategy of the United States, which if you haven't read, you should read. It's available on the Internet. It was interpreted by President Bush on March 16th of this year when he proclaimed that we choose to deal with challenges now rather than leaving them for future generations. We fight our enemies abroad instead of waiting for them to arrive at our country. We seek to shape the world, not merely to be shaped by it, to influence events for the better instead of being at their mercy. And in this statement, there are three key words, challenges, now, and fight. What precisely do those words mean in terms of American policy, and why are they important for you and me uh, and all of us to understand? What the doctrine says about challenge is that some states, such as Syria and Iran, continue to harbor terrorists at home and sponsor terrorist activity abroad. Any government that chooses to be an ally of terror, such as Syria and Iran, has chosen to be an enemy of freedom, justice, and peace. The world must hold those regimes to account. Iran has violated the non-proliferation uh, treaty safeguards, refuses to provide objective guarantees that its nuclear program is solely for peaceful purposes. We may face no greater challenge from a single country than from Iran. The Iranian regime sponsors terrorism, threatens Israel, seeks to thwart Middle Eastern peace, disrupts democracy in Iraq, and denies the aspiration of its people for freedom. That's a pretty strong challenge, 
and one has to look into it with some care. One of the problems, uh, to digress a moment, that I think all of us face is uh, in the various statements that we hear from the government and we read in the press, it's very important that we look at them carefully, analyze where they come from, uh, see what they mean, who's behind them, what the, what the issues are that they purport to tell us. The first one of these charges is, is sponsoring terrorism. It's, it's a highly likely charge, it seems to me, since all states support terrorism when it's in their interest to do so. America has done so in Iraq, Afghanistan, Central America, and many other places and many other times. Iranians remember we overthrew their elected government in August 1953 and aided Saddam Hussein in his uh, war with Iran from 1980 to 1988. And it's no secret we're now engaged in covert activities uh, in Iran, which are calculated to destabilize, that word has entered all of our vocabularies, I guess, its government and incite revolt amongst its ethnic minorities. France, Britain, Israel, Russia, most other countries have long records of using terrorism. So what we should look for is what Iran has actually done or not done. In Iraq, its role has been so far surprisingly restrained. As a close neighbor and the focal point of the religion and culture of the majority of the Iraqi people, it obviously has a major interest in Iraq. But despite uh, a great deal of, of charge, particularly in the press, and stirring up trouble there, I've heard very little convincing proof that Iran is, is playing a major role in Iraqi affairs. If anything, it's playing a moderating game with the Iraqi Shia community, uh, as the U.S. government has acknowledged by seeking the advice and help recently on how, better, how to achieve better relations with the Shia community, of whom there are 15 million uh, in Iraq. Indeed, the Iranians believe with reason that they are the targets uh, of terrorist attacks conceived in American-occupied Iraq. One group known as the People's Mujahideen uh, is composed of, Iraqi, of Iranian exiles sorry, living in Iraq, and that has carried out terrorist attacks in Iran, uh, and we have labeled it as a terrorist organization. The U.S. government has. <coughs> Iran has cooperated with the Turks to stop what at least the Turks regard as a terrorist challenge to their country from the Kurds. It also played a crucial role in the defeat of the Taliban, uh, largely at our request. And so far, at least, it's kept out of the affairs of the two million strong Shia community in eastern Saudi Arabia, which is the group, incidentally, that produces the oil in Saudi Arabia, and the majority Shia community in the little island state of Bahrain. But Iraq has certainly helped the Hezbollah partisans in Lebanon with both money and military equipment. Uh, it doesn't regard the Hezbollah group as a terrorist organization, but as a legitimate political party. That's obviously up for debate. But it sees Hezbollah's um, activities as primarily defensive. Uh, it believes that the uh, attack on Hezbollah had been planned by Israel and, uh, and helped by the United States not just as a rejoinder to the abduction of two Israeli soldiers, but in fact was planned uh, a long time ago, and was certainly armed and paid for by our government. But American officials, including Elliot Abrams of the National Security Council, one of the men I mentioned in the neoconservative group, who was in charge of the uh, American relations with Iran, uh, have been very deeply involved in this activity. And um, what is really striking to the Israelis, according to a former member of the Israeli parliament who passed this on to me, was that for the first time the Arabs put up a good resistance. The interesting thing about the Shia population in Lebanon, and I suspect also in Iran, which is important for us to reckon for the future, is that they are very serious people and they uh, stand and fight literally to the death. I imagine that the Israeli leaders would describe their policy as support for freedom fighters, and they believe that our involvement in the attack on Lebanon and various other actions against Iran is itself tantamount to support for terrorism. The old saying, as you all know, is that one man's terrorist is another man's freedom fighter, and one of the problems that we have very often 
is it is very difficult for us to ferret out the opinions of other people and take that into account to try to understand what it is that they're doing and what we might help them reorganize in some way that would more closely fit our own objectives. The next major point is, does Iran, as Mr. Bush says, threaten Israel? Israel has the strongest army in Western Asia and somewhere between 400 and 600 nuclear weapons. No one believes that Iran now has any nuclear weapons. And in fact, the founder of the current regime, and for all of the very bad things one can say about him, Ayatollah Khomeini stopped the program to help Iran get nuclear weapons, which the Shah had started with American aid some years ago. It also has no capacity to transport its army abroad. It has 850,000 men under arms, but the army is relatively backward and relatively weak. So hearing of an Iranian threat to Israel reminds me of one of the charges that, that got us into the war in Iraq, that Saddam Hussein was about to attack America with chemical, biological, and other weapons which he didn't have. Um, does it have the intent to do this? Uh, even if it doesn't have the current means. There's a famous quotation uh, that is very often brought up that uh, President uh, Mahmoud uh, uh, Ahmadi Najid uh, has given out, which was partially mistranslated. It's usually given out that he intended to wipe Israel off the map. He certainly doesn't like Israel and has said a number of harsh words about it, but he actually didn't say quite what the quotation said what he said is that Israel is an anomaly uh, in the current world situation and will either have to transform itself or one way or another will fade away. And many outside observers uh, have come up with very similar things. Just a couple of weeks ago, one of the senior men on the BBC came out and told an audience at the International Institute of Strategic Affairs in London, we might now be witnessing the long beginning of the end of the Zionist State of Israel. So what he said was certainly controversial and certainly uh, ran athwart many of the things that most Americans believe, but it was by no means unusual. And many people say the same things in private, but don't say them in public. What about nuclear weapons? That's the really tough issue. While Iran has been a difficult and recalcitrant party to the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, it at least has been a signator, whether, whether neither Israel, India, nor Pakistan ever even signed it. And of course, North Korea dropped out of it. Israel has, in fact, had a clandestine nuclear weapons program for over 50 years. Pakistan and India both developed their weapons secretly, and India, uh, Israel, Pakistan, and North Korea have weapons programs and already have weapons, whereas as far as we have ever been able to find out, Iran does not. And the general guess is that it will take it five to ten years to develop nuclear weapons. So the, the issue is not quite as dramatic as, as it sometimes is made to seem. Moreover, uh, the charge that it has violated the Non-Proliferation Treaty is actually not quite true. What it did violate was a codicil to the treaty, which was negotiated by the foreign ministers of Britain, France, and Germany, um, and which was not uh, passed by the Iranian parliament. My um, rather controversial take on this is that it really isn't Iran which is the danger to Israel. It actually is Israel's own nuclear weapons program, which is its major danger. The reason for that is that since Israel has nuclear weapons, sooner or later all the other Middle Eastern countries that can afford to do so are going to try everything they can to acquire them. And I think probably within our lifetimes, and probably even within the next 10 years, you're going to see other states doing what uh, we now charge Iran is doing. Uh, I think it's highly likely, and I notice that Mr. McNamara, who's followed this much more closely than I, agrees with this, that Egypt, Saudi Arabia, Iran, perhaps Uzbekistan, and the very rich Gulf states, and perhaps even a reconstituted government in Iraq, will try to acquire nuclear weapons. It seems to me that what we must recognize, first of all, is that nuclear weapons anywhere 
are a threat to people everywhere. I have found in talking to groups all over the United States and Europe uh, that it's very curious how few of us remember what nuclear weapons really are like and what they really do. The effect of, a, of a, even a small nuclear weapon is absolutely catastrophic. It digs a hole in the ground about as deep as a football field and as wide as perhaps 40 football fields. It kills everybody within 10 or 12 square miles. It does far more damage outside of that. And furthermore, it throws up in the air a dust cloud, a radioactive dust cloud, of approximately uh, a million cubic meters, which then circles the globe and causes widespread cancer wherever it passes. So everything that we can possibly think of doing that would move us away from the nuclear issue and move Iran away from the nuclear issue uh, is to all of our benefit in terms of safety. Uh, Mr. Bush also charged the Iranian government with denying the aspirations of its people for freedom. I think that's perfectly true. Uh, the Iranian government uh, enforces a religious fundamentalism that is, um, to my mind, rather ugly and uh, very stultifying to the society. But it poses an even greater danger to us because if the government was, in fact, at least partially freely elected, we have to face the problem that in many parts of the world, governments that are, in quotes, democratic, are going to be governments that we really don't like and that uh, we're going to have to either accommodate to a different kind of world or we're going to uh, be in constant problems of the kind we have. The second key word in the national strategy is now. And um, uh, it seems to me that this is a very complicated word. It's like uh, the story that you all remember uh, Bill Clinton just, uh, just saying, uh, it all depends on how you define and. Um, the, the word now, uh, first of all, everyone believes in Iran is five to ten years. But there's another meaning for the word now, which is that we are engaged and have been for some time in uh, processing plans to attack Iran. Um, making plans is obviously not the same thing as implementing them. I've written a good many plans myself, and I know that very few of them ever reached any point of implementation. But having the possibility of implementing things, having them completely worked out, certainly raises the possibility that they could be implicated or they could be implemented. And given the fact that um, Mr. Bush is convinced that a nuclear Iran would pose an intolerable threat, threat to United States security, and as one intelligence uh, uh, senior man put it, he's firm in his faith that God agrees with him on that point, uh, we have a, um, a serious possibility that such plans could be implemented. And we know that um, there have been a series of war games played out uh, indeed before the invasion of Iraq, uh, which have gone through all of the episodes of uh, what would happen if we do get involved uh, in a war with Iran. And at the present time, we apparently do have special forces groups that are actually in Iran passing out money to uh, dissident tribes people and dissident minorities to encourage them to revolt against the government. And we are certainly overflying Iran uh, and pinpointing possible targets. That leads me to the third key word, which is fight. The March uh, 2005 National Defense Strategy proclaimed that America is a nation at war and warned that at the direction of the President, we will defeat adversaries at the time, place, and the manner of our choosing, and that when deterrence fails or efforts short of military action, don't forestall gathering threats. The United States will employ military power. In all cases, we'll seek to see the, seize the initiative and dictate the tempo, timing, and direction of military operations, and that these include preventive actions, that is, um, first strike uh, possibilities. So the key questions come down, it seems to me, to two. What would justify a war, and how would it be fought? First, the justification. Unless there is an imminent threat, which means that uh, uh, Iraq is about to do something that would jeopardize the security of the United States, 
uh, an attack on Iran would be a unilateral act of war, and if undertaken without congressional approval, would be unconstitutional. Of course, pretexts can be manufactured, as they were in the Gulf of Tonkin incident in the Vietnam War, and allegedly were projected for Iraq by a plan that was codenamed Anabiasis, uh, which was to uh, send a group of Iraqis into uh, Iraq, uh, seize an airfield, and if, if Saddam Hussein then tried to retaliate and destroy them, he would have uh, overdone the uh, restrictions of, uh, the, under which he was operating, and that would have been justification for war. At the present time, as I've argued, there is no reasonable justification for an attack on Iran. If we assume, as I think we must, that it's definite the Bush administration has ruled out acquiescence, and it might try sanctions. But what we learned from the sanctions that were applied in Iraq is that they don't work very well. A, an authoritarian government can protect itself and pass along the bad effects of the sanctions to its people. They furthermore hurt the surrounding countries who lose trade and so forth. And in the current case, uh, where the Chinese particularly rely on the exportation of Iranian oil, they would be extremely unattractive to all of our friends in the United Nations. I think they would not deter the Iranian government because I think it is clear that the Iranian government believes that it is on the brink of being attacked and that it would do everything to uh, promote its own survival. So the most likely form of force is military attack. And this could come in any one of several different ways. The United States could attack all alone by air power. It could have a ground invasion as it did in 1991 and 2003 in Iraq or it could encourage an Israeli attack. I'll just focus on the American side. The administration um, doctrine, as I mentioned, foresees preventive action. And the current form of preventive action that is popular, I think, if, if that's the right word, among the, the military, both in America and Israel, is an aerial bombardment. And this is attractive, of course, because a large part of the American force, American combat force, is bogged down in Iraq. America doesn't have enough troops for a land invasion uh, at the present time. And it's extremely unlikely that any of our allies would come in and help us uh, in any way with this. Every one of the governments uh, that I know of has made it clear that they are opposed to what they think we're about to do. Uh, England certainly wouldn't make up the deficit. And in the last few days, world leaders have come out flatly against the idea of the military option. The German Prime Minister told the Bundestag on September the 6th that the military option isn't an option. And while she was speaking, the Chinese Foreign Minister said, China advocates that this issue be resolved through negotiation and dialogue in a peaceful way, and this position remains unchanged. The French Foreign Minister proclaimed on the September the 5th that France doesn't support military action, and the Italian and Russian governments uh, echoed the same sentiment. Probably the sole ally that America would have if it goes down the road that I fear is Israel. Its former chief of staff, General Moshe Yalon, recently told an audience in Washington that Israel was prepared to act, but that even before the disastrous, that was before the disastrous outcome of the Israeli attack on Lebanon, other Israeli officials had pulled back and said, this is purely an American operation. We're not going to be involved. What would an aerial bombardment entail? What it involved in Iraq gives us a starting point. There were some 17,000 sorties by American Air Force planes that dropped 13,000 cluster munitions that exploded into two million bombs, wiping out whole areas. And the, the um, Air Force fired 23,000 missiles. Naval ships uh, launched 750 cruise missiles with another million and a half pounds of explosives. We're told today these weapons have now been improved. Air Force General Thomas McInerney gave the conservative, a neoconservative magazine, The Weekly Standard, in April, an inventory of the improved weapons that include 14-ton bunker busters and a whole series of other things. He pointed out that a B-2 bomber can drop 80 500-pound bombs independently targeted so that um, they think they could hit most of the supposed over a 1,000 
uh, different sites that they would have to be aimed at. In effect, this bom aerial bombardment would eclipse the shock and awe of the 2003 uh, attack on Iraq. And of course, it would be far more destructive than the 1991 campaign or the devastating air war on Vietnam. But would it work? Uh, we have a test case in Lebanon. And Seymour Hirsch uh, of The New Yorker had talks with a number of current intelligence and military people who told him that the Israeli bombing of Lebanon was regarded by both the Air Force, our Air Force, and the Israelis as a kind of prelude to a potential American preemptive attack to destroy Israel's nuclear uh, installations. But everyone has indicated that the Israelis have found it extremely uh, disappointing. It didn't do what they set out to do. It didn't destroy the Hamas uh, or the uh, Hezbollah organization. And as the former Deputy Secretary of State Richard uh, Armitage said, if the most dominant military force in the region, the Israeli Defense Force, can't pacify a country like Lebanon with a population of four million, you should think carefully about taking uh, that template to Iran with strategic depth and a population of 70 million. The only thing that bombing has achieved so far, he said, is to unite the uh, population against the Israelis. Uh, Seymour Hirsch went on, I uh, was told by the Air Force proposals for an aerial bombardment had been resisted by the senior generals of the Army, Navy, and Marine Corps. I'll mention some of them later. They argue, he said, that the Air Force plan won't work and will inevitably lead, as the Israeli war with Hezbollah, to the insertion of troops on the ground. General Wesley Clark uh, commented that, in my experience, air campaigns have to be backed ultimately by the will and capability to finish the job on the ground. So um, why would we go ahead with this program? I am getting the word from all over the American government and from many outside the government that the decision for war has already been made. The Washington Post reported that at least since March, large teams are at work on invasion plans in the Pentagon and the intelligence agencies, while the so-called Iran desk in the State Department has been augmented to task force size. It's headed by a man who was on the staff of the International Republican Institute and who worked under Elizabeth Cheney, the Vice President's daughter, who is now the Assistant Secretary of State for the Near East. And in the Pentagon, a similar organization has been established to replace the one that, um, um, in effect, itself replaced the Office of National Estimates in the CIA and the Office of Intelligence and Research in the State Department under the same man who ran it before, uh, Abram Shulsky, one of the leaders of the uh, neoconservative group uh, who ran the Office of Special Plans. In addition, a new outpost has been set up in Dubai to coordinate plans. And from London, a, a conservative uh, newspaper, which is very close to the defense establishment there, reported that the senior British generals have concluded that an American attack is inevitable. So um, I think it's fair to say we're right on the, the brink of a major, major change in, in American life and society and, and the direction of our government abroad. What would a war entail? What would it do to our lives? That must be the question that all of us really ought to think about. Now, obviously, I'm not privy to the work of, of the planners in the government, but I think its shape and direction is not hard to guess. Um, Iran has an army of 850,000 people, uh, very much like uh, Saddam Hussein's smaller army, and it probably would be wiped out in an aerial attack. But Iran also has a 150,000-man National Guard, which would immediately take up guerrilla warfare. They showed their fanatical devotion to their country during the Iraq-Iran War and almost certainly would do it again. Iran has several times the population of Iraq, in fact, three times the population, would almost certainly fight a protracted guerrilla war. And preparing for it, Iran has been building a stockpile of suitable equipment from, for example, armor-piercing rifles to night vision goggles and other things useful for guerrilla warfare for several years now, and built installations all over the country from which these groups could operate. 
And although the governing religious establishment is not popular among many Iranians, the Iranians are firm nationalists, and no more than the Iraqis in 2003, or the Cubans in the Bay of, Pig, in the Bay of Pigs invasion in uh, 1961, would they be out on the streets with flowers in their hands and welcoming uh, American incoming troops. The war would be fought also not only in Iran, as the Iranian government has warned us, but in other areas. The first of these is a counterattack with Iran's uh, missile force. We don't think they have any nuclear weapons. We don't think they probably have anything very much in the, in the form of biological or chemical weapons, but we don't know. They may have. The second is a so-called oil weapon, which is a very important thing. If Iran uh, takes its 5% of the world's flow of oil off the market, which might happen whether or not it wishes to in the event of a, of a conflict, the price of oil will skyrocket. The recent price rise went from $50 a barrel to approximately $80 a barrel, and that reduced American income by $102 billion. A rise to $120 billion would cost an additional $680 billion. The effect on America and the world economy of a larger price rise would be catastrophic. At $150 uh, a barrel oil, which many experts think likely, it would be nearly $1,200,000,000. The question is, of course, is this unrealistic? Iran would almost surely not be would not fight or be an isolated campaign. It would spill over into other areas. As I mentioned, Saudi Arabia's oil is produced by workers who are presumably sympathetic to uh, Iran and might engage in sabotage or strikes, so that uh, it's very likely that much more oil would be pulled off the market than just the Iranian oil. And the third aspect of the war is almost certain to be an enormous increase in attacks on American targets worldwide. The Shias constitute a large part of the population of the Gulf states, Pakistan, and even Turkey. In Lebanon, the most powerful single political group is Balaz, of course, Shia-based. And, of course, uh, Iraq now has a Shia-led government, many of whom, whose leaders have spent most of their lives in Iran and have very deep contacts. An American attack on Iran would certainly push the Iraqi Shias in what's been so far mainly a Sunni uh, resistance movement. It would do more to unite all of the Iraqis against Americans than anything they could possibly do on their own. So, considering now the costs of even an initially successful operation, um, we have to reckon that the money costs, if I tick these off if I may, of the, the war in Iraq so far have been $7.1 billion a month. That figures out to $337 million a day or $10 million an hour. Um, and Iraq is, let's say, a quarter the size or the quarter of the danger of Iran. So we have to multiply all the figures that I would give you by roughly three or four to arrive at what uh, Iran or a war in Iran would cost us. The real cost of the war in Iraq to American society is, as calculated by Joseph Stiglitz here, who won the Nobel Prize in Economics, and Linda uh, Bilmes, um, is approximately one to two trillion dollars. So perhaps Iran would cost us between four and eight trillion dollars. American casualties uh, in Iraq have been 2,600, give or take a little bit. Iran might be some multiple again of that. The American wounded in Iraq are approximately 18,000, of whom roughly half are permanently incapacitated. So perhaps there would be, let's say, 80,000 American uh, wounded if we got into a war in Iran. Also, we have only just learned that um, there are two other categories that we really didn't even know about before. There are approximately 50,000 young American service people who are now in need of long-term psychiatric care. Many of them are sufficiently afraid of what has happened to them that they're afraid they may even harm their own families. And so um, there is a great deal of disturbance about what we are re-injecting into American society as a consequence of the war. Another um, 
another 50,000 or so uh, have multiple or severe concussions resulting in memory loss, fuzzy thinking, severe headaches and various and sundry other things. I won't go on. Uh, see, I have just a couple of minutes left here, but uh, um, I think the question really that we come down to is finally, what should we do? It seems to me that the most intelligent starting point is almost always to ask what the other side wants to see if we can find something that we can reach some modus vivendi on. And it seems to me that Iran wants just three things. They want, first of all, access to the top order of technology, which is symbolized and partly contained in nuclear science. They secondly want parity with the major powers of the world. It's impossible to overemphasize the Iraqi national uh, sense of their heritage. And thirdly, they want protection against invasion and regime change. And their particular point in this is, of course, against the United States, which has talked constantly in the last few years about changing the regime. And they don't forget, as I mentioned, that President Bush has designated three countries as the axis of evil. The regime of one, Iraq, was destroyed. The regime of the second is untouchable because it has a nuclear weapon. And the cost of trying regime change there would be prohibitive. That leaves Iran. And I believe everyone who wishes to understand Iran can do so simply by just putting himself in the position of the Iranian president. What would you do if you were in his shoes? And it seems to me the obvious answer is that you, you try to get a nuclear weapon. So what we need to do is to find a way to get away from this and see if we can't move toward uh, some kind of system that we can encourage Iran not to have nuclear weapons. What we need to do, first of all, I think, is to renounce the doctrine of a preemptive strike. Um, we had to do this um, never formally, never officially done, but over the years, more or less informally with the Russians. We must stop trying to subvert the Iranian regime, and we must engage, as we're doing even with North Korea, in dialogue. And there's some hope that that may be happening uh, in a very limited way today. And urgently and intelligently and energet uh, energetically, we need to move toward regional nuclear disarmament. We have experience in this field. We did a reasonably good job vis-a-vis -vis the Russians years ago. And it's to everybody's interest that we move in this direction. Uh, it's the, to the Israeli interest because if they don't move in this direction, uh, they're going to be surrounded with nuclear powers. And sooner or later, one of them is either going to have an accident or will attack Israel. It's to the American national interest because we don't want to have terrorism in the world and, and nuclear dangers and so forth either. And it's to the Persians' interest because if we do get into a war with them, we're going to certainly kill at least 100,000 Persians and destroy their country. But the final question is, is really anybody thinking in these terms? And that, I find, is very um, disturbing. As a people, we're enormously forgetful. We should have learned from history that foreign powers can't win guerrilla wars. The British learned this from our ancestors in the American Revolution and relearned it in Ireland. Napoleon learned it in Spain. The Germans learned it in Yugoslavia. We should have learned it in Vietnam, and the Russians learned it in Afghanistan and are learning it all over again in Chechnya, and we're learning it, of course, in Iraq. Guerrilla warfares are almost unwinnable. As a people, we're also very vain. Our, our way of life is the only way. We should have learned that the rich and powerful can't always succeed against the poor and less powerful. And rather than being caught in failures as we were in Vietnam and are now in Iraq, we need to anticipate problems and anticipate what other people are thinking about. We need particularly in this case to go back and relook at the 1968 Nuclear Nonproliferation Treaty, which was bound to be challenged as it was by India, Pakistan, and, of course, Israel. And as a people, we're astonishingly ignorant about the world. This is one of the things that's so important about your organization. But you have your work cut out for you. Long ago, the great American satirist uh, uh, Ambrose Bierce remarked that war was God's way of teaching the Americans geography. <laughs> we proved to be very poor pupils. The results of surveys are extremely depressing. The National Geographic and Roper this year found that after three years of war in Iraq, 
six out of ten young Americans couldn't even locate Iraq on a map, uh, much less knowing anything about the people who live there, or what they believe in, what they want, what they're all about. But the irony is that the upper reaches of our government are also uh, involved in a very difficult situation. The neoconservatives, none of whom seem to have ever experienced combat, have become the, the chicken hawks, as they've been called. And irony, ironically, the major military officers are now the people who are warning us against the war. Marine Corps General Gregory Newbold has urged the senior officers to put aside their careers and speak out in public with what they're, with what they're saying in private, that our policy is putting our society in mortal danger. Marine General Anthony Zinni, former chief of the Central Command, has characterized the neoconservatives as insane. And the policy of staying the course is heading over Niagara Falls. Uh, Marine Corps General Joseph Hoare, who was Commander-in-Chief of the U.S. Central Command, called for the government to get rid of these people, the neoconservatives, who sold the President on the need for the invasion of Iraq. This is not a partisan matter, rather it is a national interest. We need to protect our country, and we need to find ways of doing it. Richard, I'll stop just one half a minute more. Richard Clark, the former National Coordinator for Security and Counterterrorism, came out with a statement recently. The parallels of the run-up to the war in Iraq, uh, or run-up to the war with Iraq, are all too striking. Congress didn't ask the hard questions then. It must not permit the administration to mount another war whose outcome cannot be known, or worse, be known too well. Now, I have received recently privately a note that the, um, the senior man in the Pentagon's um, intelligence analysis organization has said that the current course of action would be an absolute disaster. George Bush Sr. wrote after the 1991 war, had we gone the invasion route, the United States could conceivably be an occupying power in a bitterly hostile land. He was right. We are. The question is, are we going to follow his advice or the lead of his son? Thank you very much. Yes, sure. Uh, Dr. Pope will answer a few questions. Remember our rule, one question only, and a question, not a speech. Thank you. Are you going to Would you like to Why don't you call on Okay. Um, yes, sir. Uh, Dr. Pope, how is the Bush administration rationalizing the economic and other costs that you describe uh, regarding a preemptive strike on Iran, at Iran, rather. The question was, how is the Bush administration rationalizing its its decision to attack uh, with the uh, economic factors that I've brought in mind? Economic and other factors. Well, first the economic factor. I think one of the things that was done in order to protect us from uh, the, the decisions that were made in Iraq, we borrowed $540 billion in fiscal year 2004 to um, offset uh, our expenditures. Um, I think that course of action will be followed as long as it can be. Um, I've, I think that the problem is um, all the way through, these decisions appear to me to be made on ideological rather than rational grounds. And I think the interesting thing is that uh, all of the people that I know who have been intelligence officers in the government are either now out of position or have uh, been reassigned to other duties. It, ap appear, it appears that the administration simply doesn't want to hear them. And as we know, that's what they did on, on the case of, uh, of Iraq. Yes. Yes. Um, how receptive has Israel been? Have you approached anyone in the Israeli? Uh, sorry. How receptive do you think Israel will be giving up its nuclear program? I think it will be very difficult to do. Uh, I had a long talk with the Israeli general staff uh, back in the early 1960s when Demona, their, their Israeli uh, organization, was still secret and, and uh, was still um, very much in contention. And at that time, uh, my argument to them was that Israel had no need of nuclear weapons, having the strongest army in the area. and. The answer was, um, 
what was called the Samson option, that Israel had the ability to actually pull down the pillars and the whole of the Middle East would collapse if it, uh, if it were ever attacked. But they've now had um, four wars since that time, and they've never come close to having uh, uh, the use of nuclear weapons. Yes? When you discuss the bombing Iran and what could be done in the sense of making the American public more aware of how imminent this uh, uh, threat is, uh, perhaps I haven't seen that having the New York Times and other papers uh, promote this, give a synopsis of your speech, and perhaps other people or like-minded senators could have a resolution in Congress stating that they're against hacking. But we'll take the question. We'll take the question. Um, my colleague, uh, um, former Senator George McGovern, uh, commented that during the Vietnam War we had an operative uh, Congress. Um, my distinguished colleague, John Bradamus, who was um, Perhaps the best of all the congressmen uh, may disagree with this, but I think today we don't really have the same kind of operation. Senator Fulbright convened a, uh, an educational process for the public in which they went over all the issues in Vietnam and, and brought out the major uh, concerns, the major possibilities. I think the, the thing that I learned in my time on the Policy Planning Council was that you need to decide what it is that you want to do. You need to find out what the other person wants to do. You need to find out what the various options that you have are, and then, in effect, cost them out as, as you would if it were a business decision. How much does this one cost? What's the likelihood of success? What What is the, the downside risk and so forth? And those are, uh, are not difficult things to do, but they, they do require a considerable background in studying uh, an area. How to get that to the public, which is the basis of really of your question, is a very hard uh, project. I find spending a great deal of my time in Europe and reading every day the Israeli press and the French press and the English press and the American press, we're talking about different worlds. The American press gives us a picture of the world that really is nobody else in the world shares. And um, we have a terribly difficult problem finding out things. Uh, in, uh, in this book on uh, uh, out of Iraq, we talk about what, what the intelligent citizen can do and what he must do. He must start by demanding the government tell him the truth and, and tell him enough. And then he must go on from there to find out where he can get information. And today we're very lucky that we have the Internet where tremendous amounts of information are put out. A lot of it may not be very sophisticated. Some of it may be totally wrong. But uh, there is a lot that's available. And it, uh, it takes time, however, to, to, to ferret this kind of information out. But all over the United States, there are now some 3,000 colleges and universities that are teaching courses on world affairs. So that practically every community in America has some kind of access to people who are at least interested in what's going on in the world. And um, um, what we need to do, it seems to me, is to start with the school system. If we graduate children from high school who don't know where our countries are in the world, um, then really we have very little ground of hope, it seems to me. Yes, sir. Uh, President Bush talks about threats to the United States, but access to oil over the long run, especially in competition with Russia and China, seems to be a major factor. Do you see any possibility that Russia or China could be neutralized or brought in to a collaborative relationship with the United States in trying to work out problems in the Middle East? Uh, yes, I do. I think that both countries are very worried about the impact on their societies um, of what would happen if we get into this, what I think is a disastrous war. Uh, if you go back to the 1991 war, it turns out that the Turks are allies in the Middle East, who we were very disturbed about because they didn't want American planes flying over and bombing Iraq from Turkey or th over Turkish airspace. Uh, they lost, they believe, $20 billion dollars 
of the sanctions program during the 1990s. The Jordanians lost a great deal of money too. The uh, Chinese and the Russians today are not going to be very keen about any move that's going to cut into their trade. Um, and uh, particularly the Chinese relying very heavily on Persian oil, which has something like 11% of the world's known oil reserves, and it's the second largest gas uh, reserve in the world. Um, is certainly going to be, as, as we find now in the votes in the United Nations, they're going to be very much opposed to anything that is going to disrupt that. And it isn't just the Persians, that, as I mentioned, that would be disrupted. All along the um, Persian Gulf, which, where something like 40% of the world's oil flows, um, there are Persian installations ready to attack tankers uh, with missiles. And um, since the oil is produced by workers who are Shia in Saudi Arabia, there's a reasonable chance that Saudi Arabian oil would be disrupted too, so that I think the chances are that the whole the whole world economy could be thrown into a terrible depressionary cycle. Now, uh, sorry, uh, I, I, <laughs> I apologize for going on too long on this, but um, to get people to work for you or, or with you, it seems to me, is not an impossible thing if you figure out what they really want to do and what's really important. We got into one problem after another in the Middle East over the failure to distinguish between ownership of a production facility and the use of the oil that came out of it. We almost got into a war with Iran back in the 1950s because they, the Iranians nationalized the British oil company. And it didn't really make any difference whose flag went up on the flagpole on the oil field. What mattered was the oil flowing out. And of course, the people who produce oil don't make any money if they don't sell it. So what they, their interest is, the same as our interest basically, is to produce oil and sell it on the world market. Where we get into trouble is where we create monopoly situations. And we've just done that in Iraq. And I don't want to get, that's another big topic to get into tonight, but I do discuss that in this book uh, on Iraq. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I, uh, I was a gunner on a B-24 bomber uh, on 29 missions against Japanese targets. And uh, 10 days after the war ended, I flew over both Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and I saw those, you know, empty cities the way, the way they were. And uh, what I wonder is, how do you go about diffusing the mind of a man who wants to sincerely kill off 20 million uh, Israelis or whatever exists? He just wants to kill them all off. And how do you diffuse his mind? Because this is just a, a, a taunt that goes on forever. And if he had, if he had the bomb, I think he would use it. Well, I, as I said, uh, two things. First of all, I don't really think that's what the Persians have been saying. Yeah. I think they've been saying that uh, they don't like Israel, but that they have not said they're going to attack Israel and wipe it out. But I think the more important thing is that what we need to do, as I've said, is to cut back on all the issues of, of, of nuclear capability. Uh, and your personal experience is a, is a very valid one uh, in this. Uh, what bothers me is that I think so few people really even remember what nuclear weapons do. And, um, and that we need, that's one aspect of the educational process we all need to spend more time on.